here. I used to uh, teach uh, my alma mater, so it was more than 20 years ago. Glad to uh, feeling uh, like I'm teaching again uh, in this uh, environment. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to know my audience. Uh, I believe it's a, a diverse audience. We have people from students, academic, government, and private sector. Can I just have a show of hands? Who are the students? Uh, you know? Are there students? Yeah. Okay. And then from the academic faculty of uh, the university. Okay. And then from the government sector, regulators. So. Oh, marami, I have to behave. Uh, <laughs> and the private sector. Okay. Good. All right. So. Great. Uh, the, the topic, uh, I know uh, most of you, I guess, have uh, attended the interesting uh, lectures uh, prior to this. I believe this is the second to the last. No? Um, and and I, I've gone through uh, some of the presentations, so at least I know what you've been through already and hopefully can synthesize, because it's a pretty broad topic uh, that I was asked to cover. You know? uh, optimal investments in uh, uh, generation is pretty broad. So what I'll try to do with you is first I'll do it from a more from a case study type approach because we've got a great story to tell and uh, learning experiences that I'd love to, to share with you in terms of starting AC Energy from six seven years ago uh, and, and tell that story and what are the big insights uh, not only on our company but most especially in the industry and the country as a whole. You know? And our thinking, uh, even beyond uh, the Philippine shores, as we're starting to go uh, regional in such a short span of time. So that's the first thing I'd like to walk you through from the point of view of uh, AC Energy, the company, and Ayala, why did we enter, uh, what were the considerations, etc. It's going to be strategic, macro. Um, and so forth. I also want to share with you the burning issues in the industry today. Uh, I will leave time for for Q and A uh, a lot of time because there's a lot of interesting issues that I'd love to, to discuss uh, with you. Um, and then, if the more technical aspects of investing, I would leave out, but feel free to ask that in the Q and A uh, forum. You know, we're talking about how. How you select the best EPC contractor, the best financing terms, uh, how do we think about the returns, etc. I'll, I'll leave that out, but if you're interested, I can do that on a case by case basis. Uh, okay. I only have six slides. Uh, you know, sorry to disappoint you, but I, I've, I've seen the past presentations of you know 100 plus slides. I wonder if they went through all of it. I talk a lot, as you can imagine. Uh, so I, I just try to limit myself to no more than 10 slides, to, to, so that we're not rushing and have a, a so let me begin um, with a snapshot of our story. You know, we, we, we started this in 2011 as per the, the introduction. Um, I have no experience, I have zero experience in power. When I headed Ayala in 2009, headed Ayala as a corporate strategy and development uh, group, you know, which is responsible for mapping out the strategy for the conglomerate, for the Ayala group. Especially answering the question, what is the next big thing? What's the new sector that Ayala uh, should be going uh, into? You know? So at that point in time, we thought that energy and infrastructure were areas where the, the country needed uh, a lot of investment in, uh, and, and that we had a role uh, to play in. You know? So we, uh, I'll go through the background in a bit, but the snapshot of AC Energy is we, we started in a very modest way in 2011 with our first investment, first couple of investments. Our very first investment actually is a 50% stake in Northman, very small. No. Back then Northman was 33 megawatts. People almost laughed at us. Uh, you know, you're a guy, you're so big, and you're first in, you know, you announce your market entry with an investment in Northman. A minority stake, you know, 50% stake, 33 megawatts, so 16 megawatts attributable uh, capacity. The, the thinking behind that is that was not our, you know, main strategy. You know, our main strategy being Ayala and big, we want things to, we want to enter into a big platform, you know, ideally speaking. 
Um, so we looked for, for the ideal platform to invest in. Remember, that was 2010. That, uh, the, the, the notion then was we are going to enter a period of shortage of supply in the next four, five, six years. Right? So we thought, okay, so that we could help, um, because with every problem there's also opportunities, no? why don't we find a big platform to invest in? Easier said than done. When we scoped out the market and we were coming off a crisis, remember the global financial crisis, you know, it didn't hit the Philippines uh, hard. No? It was short and it was shallow, the, the correction here in the Philippine market. And with this looming crisis back then, no? It was a seller's market. Yes, we could buy into an energy platform, but we had to pay a massive uh, premium. No? So valuation, entry valuation would have been uh, an issue. It was an issue. So it was very difficult. It was a good idea on paper, but getting the, the platform, almost impossible, unless you, quote unquote, overpaid. So we thought, you know what, let's not uh, be too choosy. Let's just enter the market and learn it. No, and there was an opportunity in Northwind. It was small, you know, small ticket size. Uh, even if you paid a little bit premium, it won't uh, hurt uh, and so forth. But at least we were there. It was like a calling card. Hey, we're serious. We may be small, but it's serious. And it started to attract attention because the market, you know, thanks to the, the sponsor uh, behind uh, uh, AC Energy, um, they know that it's a serious uh, sponsor with large balance sheet, good track record, good reputation, and so forth. So true enough, uh, the opportunity started to, to come in. You know, uh, one of those first ones was as a tech, Finma Energy, back then they were Trans Asia. They were developing um, for the past seven years. So since 2004, if I'm not mistaken, they've been developing this Greenfield project in Kanaka, Batangas. No? It takes a long time to develop a, a power plant, even before you no issue your notice to proceed uh, to start construction. So, you know, they, they wanted a partner. They wanted to spread the financial risk, you know, the, the risk. Um, uh, they wanted to, you know, for many reasons, they looked for a partner. And long story short, uh, we ended up uh, being uh, partners with them. So, year one, we, uh, we had a very modest entry of 77 megawatts attributable to Ayala, AC Energy. But over the course of six years, we ended last year with 1,620 megawatts, so 20 fold growth. Uh, you know, we, we, we received accolades for this. We, we recently received the, the fastest growing platform uh, in 2017 you know, uh, from, from a, a London based uh, international finance line. So, so that encapsulates the, the, the rapid um, uh, expansion. And again, this is a, a symptom of the need and opportunities in, in the market and the seriousness and, and the, the sponsorship uh, behind uh, AC Energy. We did it through partnerships. No? So one of the unique uh, characteristics of, of uh, all of these projects, uh, I'm sure that more than half of you don't even understand uh, the, the words here. These are the project names, no? but basically uh, this is a very nuanced uh, story. No? So I have to be careful about not assuming that you understand uh, what's on the slide. But I'll give you an example. The, the key strategy that we ended up uh, employing is to partner. Okay, because what did we, what did we um, uh, uh, choose from in terms of possible entry modes. One is acquire an existing platform. I already told you it doesn't work. Second is build greenfield projects by ourselves from scratch. No one has power experience uh, from uh, Ayala back then. So yes, we can acquire that, build that, but it's going to take us 10, 15 years before we put our first uh, plan to break ground, <laughs> not to mention to construct. So not a viable strategy. When we look at the market, there is, there is a group of um, uh, players called developers. You know, I never knew that these developers existed before I took a serious look at the power sector. You know, these developers, like power partners or the, the, the developer behind GN Power, which is arguably our most important, um, uh, one of our more important partners, you know, um, 
because of the scale that we were able to do uh, with them, you know, are people who do a lot of the heavy lifting, the groundwork. You know? They do the permitting, the, the site selection, the permitting, the studies, all the contracting, whether it's with contractors or with an off-taker. Um, they do all of the legwork. They put together the project. What they don't have is the balance sheet. They don't have the big balance sheet that's required to finance a power plant. And without the big balance sheet, you won't attract the banks. No, there's no project, right? But without the development, the pre-development, the homework, all the permit studies, uh, uh, etc., no, there's no project. So I saw that as a perfect complementarity, right? Here we are, you know, the the new you know the the new kids in, on the block, but with no development experience in power. And here's these these guys who saw a perfect fit. And by the way, the incumbent players, the likes of uh, Aboides, Maralpa, San Miguel, Lopez Group, etc., they don't see much value in these developers as we do, because these incumbents do have that capability already. Or at least for some of them, they think they do. But these guys, these developers are really, really good. Right? So to me, that weakness became a strength. We, we, we nurtured that to be a strength. In the same way that the challenges, the problems that the country uh, were facing are actually uh, opportunities to, to invest and earn a decent uh, return. No. So that was one, you know, this is just one um, uh, insight that I'd like to, to share in terms of how do you achieve this almost exponential growth of 20 times over the last six years? We don't do it by ourselves, we do it with partners. We look for complementarities. So, moving on, here's some interesting, you should have been, you, let's look at the left hand side first because I didn't have the sophistication to do a build up. Anyway, what were we thinking? What was our worldview back in 2010 when we were first looking at the market? Number one, there was, as I mentioned earlier, there was an imminent supply shortage. It's coming, no? Because it takes time to build a power plant. No one really built a significant plant until GM Power um, uh, decided to break it out in 2010. But between 2000 and 2010, you know, a lot of power plants were built in the 90s. Uh, those of you who are, uh, you know. Um, most of us were right in the 90s because there's a few students here in the room, but it, we, we all recall the, the shortage in the 90s, President Ramos' time. Um, so a lot of plants were built no, in the 90s, right? And so there was oversupply for a long time in the early uh, 2000s. So no one built a, a plant. But as in a class, that was one big uh, um, driver of why there was an imminent shortage. And then Peralta was also. Uh, at that time, in the 2000s, were facing uh, difficulties, no? regulatory challenges, etc. So they didn't contract also um, at that time. So it was, it took time before the industry um, evolved. No? And Epira, obviously, uh, the Power Reform Act uh, took time before uh, it really took off. No? So there's a lot of delay in the reforms in the industry. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but the fact is, we saw the supply shortage uh, coming. No? We also thought that there's a high barrier to, to entry. It's a high capex. Not everyone can afford uh, these high capex. There's only a, a, a good number of big business groups in the Philippines who could uh, do this. So we thought this is not for everyone. So, so we, we have the, the right to participate here, we thought. The third is, you know, when we look at the market, it's in the structure of the economics, it's very attractive because the underlying business um, model for power, at least back then, is very stable cash flows because the project is underpinned by a long-term power purchase agreement by a credit-worthy off-taker. That is the heart of a power project in the utility model. I'll talk about the market competitive merchant model uh, later on. But back then, we were still in this utility model where you, know, you negotiate, or you win a bidding for a long-term contract, that's a great start. You have a project. You will have a project, right? And you will have stable, predictable cash flows. 
Now, one of the reasons why Ayala also entered when, when we were crafting out our long-term strategy is Ayala is um, exposed to cyclical industries. You know, when the times are good, we're doing really well, real estate banking. But, you know, when times are bad, you know, these are cyclical. You, you, you're susceptible. We want to balance infrastructure-type returns, steady, predictable returns. You know, whether the economy, economy is doing uh, well or not so well, you know, utilities, if you have a power purchase agreement, it provides very stable returns. So it's a nice mix. Because remember, in 2009, I, I had to look at Ayala from a holistic perspective, from a conglomerate uh, view. And that was one of the uh, reasons also for us uh, entering power and infrastructure to balance out our uh, portfolio. The next is, you know, the equity returns were attractive back then. Um, back then, uh, the typical uh, asterisk free rates in the Philippines would be in the low single digit. It reached a, a low of uh, around 3% uh, a few years ago you know, for 10 year uh, treasury. You know, unheard of. The, 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 the way cost of capital has gone down over the last few uh, decades. So, but you know, at this time, mid to high teens were the norm. It's attractive, you know, it's a very attractive. And if you look at the, the early movers, you know, Aboitis is the prime example. Aboitis entry into power totally transformed that group, totally, right? Uh, they, they made the bold move of divesting, getting out of what used to be their core business, transport, and they put a big debt on power. That's a very bold move, and hats off to, to avoid this. That, you know, catapulted them to one of the largest uh, business groups. They caught the power uh, at the right time, right? And everyone saw that, and, and that's why you know, a lot of players followed. No. But it just takes one successful example to signal to the industry, hey, uh, there's something uh, in here. And then last but not least, renewables um, potential uh, was there. We knew that the technology was evolving, that the law, uh, that there's a new law, a Renewable Energy Act uh, at that time, we thought, yes, it's early days, but this is going to be a big thing. No. At that time, uh, people criticized uh, our entry into power, saying, you're too late. You know, 2011, you're too late. You know, you should have entered pre uh, appear or at the start of Epiro when the government was auctioning all of their uh, plants, it's too late. And I said, you know what, it's too late um, uh, for, for the privatization uh, aspect, getting you know, relatively uh, uh, affordable uh, existing government plants, but it's too early, we're too early for a change, we're early because the renewables revolution is yet to unfold, number one and the full effects of the Power Reform Act, the retail competition and open competition, you know, will change the landscape of this industry. And we're too early for those two um, trends that are to come. And seven years uh, from now, I now realize what I was talking about seven years ago. I didn't realize the full extent of, of these two powerful uh, trends driven by uh, policy or regulation. No. If you look at the realities, we were wrong in many of these things. We didn't have, uh, you know, we were, we were not on the ball. A lot of it is because many other groups also saw what we saw. And there was a rising tide in the Philippines. The liquidity, we underestimated the strength of the Philippine financial system. The liquidity that was so strong and the cost of capital that got uh, so much uh, more competitive. We didn't see those, no. So as a result, instead of a shortage, the shortage never came really. I mean, yes, there were momentary shortages because of typhoon or earthquakes, etc. But fundamental shortage, we really didn't uh, experience that, no. Because there were several new entrants like us. We were not alone. Fill invest, uh, you know, etc. Uh, there's a lot of new entrants who. <coughs> join the market, even the smaller players, right? Um, and then there's also existing players, you know, the likes of Aboitis, the Lopezes, San Miguel, DMCI, they all expanded significantly. Meralto, obviously, right? So you have all of these existing and new players expanding, 
driven by the strong liquidity and the low cost of uh, capital, the easy money um, that was prevalent in the last uh, five, seven years. Um, and as a result, and the other thing that I got, uh, I, that, that I didn't get right, you know, we thought that power is about power purchase agreements and project finance, right? That's the only mode that we thought was the right mode in terms of investing in power. Any other mode is too risky, you shouldn't do it. And we assume that others will likely not do it. No. So basically, our formula back then was have the lowest cost, most competitive power, win the bids with the power purchase agreements, right? And then because of that, you get non-recourse project finance, really cheaper cost of capital to back your project up. And that's how you get good equity returns. It's like a, a given formula, not rocket science, textbook approach, right? And you'll be fine, right? And the others will not be able to, to, to invest, really. It's not right for them to invest because if they're not the lowest cost uh, producer, how can they win these contracts, right? And therefore, how can they finance these projects on a non-recourse basis? Therefore, their projects will not be real. We were dead wrong. Well, we were wrong for half uh, um, the market. The other half, you know, behaved as we would behave. The likes of Meralto. Meralto would not do um, merchant projects, as I understand. They're waiting for their power purchase agreements to be approved. Why do you think they haven't broken ground in their quote plans? Because they're still waiting, right? But for those that have been approved, they're already building, right? Just like us. But where we were wrong is that, you know, uh, Sid uh, Ponsuni is a very good uh, uh, partner and uh, friend of mine. Uh, you know, I, I was telling Sid, doing a merchant plan. He was the first one to do, he was bold enough because he had a low cost position because he owned the fuel, right? Uh, and he had a construction company. So he had all the elements to do a bold move, right? Uh, which is to do a merchant plan. Without a contract, he built 300 megawatts of uh, power plant. No. First gen also followed suit. Um, Avoides and Merben, so San Miguel, so a lot of other merchant plants, you know, over a thousand megawatts worth were built um, after uh, DMCI or Semerara uh, built uh, their own merchant plant. So, again, what we underestimated was several business groups had very strong corporate balance sheets. Power investing is not just about project finance. That's standard, but there's another model really, which is the merchant model. You use your balance sheet. If you have a strong corporate balance sheet, you don't have to go project finance. If you believe in your project and in the market, you put your balance sheet uh, at risk, you know, because if you have a large balance sheet, it's okay, it's a calculated debt. And apparently a lot of our, our, our peers in the industry had strong balance sheets, not just us. We were arguably conservative. We had strong balance sheets, but we still wanted project <laughs> finance. No, it's very textbook uh, approach. But the others, they had strong balance sheets. We can take the risk. Okay, so we don't have to wait for the perfect condition. No. Now, what's happening now is the the, the returns instead of your strong returns and predictable, they're getting less and less predictable more unpredictable, and the margins are being compressed, especially because of the oversupply situation. No. And then what also was not factored in before was the renewable energy law finally took off sometime in 2013 when the feed-in tariff system became a reality. Yes, it was five years late, but it happened anyway. And more than 1,500 megawatts worth of renewables were built in such a short span of time that was added to the system. And that meant additional capacity. And in the spot market, the way it works is you bid, and people bid typically on their fuel uh, cost, their variable cost. And whoever is the marginal plan, that's the clearing price. That's the price that everyone gets. Guess what? Renewables is zero. Right? They build all that capacity, they're a must-run uh, plan, a must-dispatch. 
So the spot market reads them as a zero bid. So that whole curve, if you can imagine, goes down. The, the clearing price now gets to the lower marginal plan thanks to the renewables. So again, this is just a, a minor plug. <laughs> Um, I might be preaching to the converted here, but when people say that renewables are expensive, you know, I'm not saying that that's a false statement, but just take things into consideration. Yes, there's a feed-in tariff allowance. We all get charged 18 centavos per kilowatt hour, soon to be 22 centavos uh, per kilowatt hour, in support of these renewable energy plants uh, uh, because of the feed-in tariff uh, system. You know? What is hard to quantify is the effect of these renewable energy plants in the spot market price, which still accounts for a large portion of our electricity bills. That spot market price is now lower in significant part also because you are injecting uh, renewables uh, in the system that's basically costing zero. Okay, so it lowers the average clearing price for the spot market. No, there are some Australian studies that say you know it more than pays for the feed-in tariff, but that's debatable. No, so it's a very complex issue. At the end of the day, there's no one number. It's just I can only explain the conceptual thing. I will not claim that the feed-in tariff, uh, that the renewables pay for themselves. No. So, but anyway, that was uh, the other factor that's explaining why prices uh, are going down and why capacity uh, is abundant uh, these days. Where are we today and where do we see the market in five years' time? Because it is an important uh, uh, consideration when you make investments. You know? If you want optimal investment decisions, you have to have a view of the market. Here is our view of the market. Uh, today, if you just take Luzon, which is still the largest um, uh, uh, portion of the market, you know, uh, we've got, uh, last year was uh, a little over 10 gigawatts of peak demand, 10,000 megawatts, right, during summer. And during summer, what we quantify here is how much theoretical capacity is available in May. At least that's how we look at capacity planning. We're not DOE, but this is how we would do it if we were DOE, right? The 12.5 is a dependable supply. It's not your nameplate. So if you look at DOE numbers, you know, you will get confused because there's many different types of metrics, right? There's nameplate capacity, gross, net, you know, etc. As we look at what's being bid in the market, you no, know, uh, in the market operator. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, geothermal, right? Uh, TV Makban, as a group, the nameplate capacity is, I don't know, almost 700 megawatts, you no, know, for that cluster. Um, but the reality is there's not enough fuel for 700 megawatts. There's only enough fuel for probably 400 something 